Thank you. Um, so my name is Ben Chan and uh, I lead the developer platform at Bitgo. So we created our first uh, multi-sig wallet back in 2013 and at the time early on, we, most of these cases were mainly just for storing coins for individual users, you know, large whales storing coins. But since then, um, as more businesses have started uh, using and keeping Bitcoin, we found out that you know, providing treasury controls in a multi-tiered kind of user environment has been quite useful for us, uh, and for them, and for us. And, uh, more recently, we've seen some differentiation in our platform in terms of processing multi-sig transactions for day-to-day -day operations using our cosigner. And so we've been hard at work uh, you know, just designing and releasing APIs and SDKs that many exchanges like Bitstamp and ATM providers like uh, Lamasu use to integrate multi-sig security into their Bitcoin applications. Uh, today, uh, we're going to look, first look at you know, just the basic ingredients for multi-sig, just pay script hash and multi-sig. And then we're going to look at some emerging multi-sig models that uh, we at Bitco have been seeing people start developing on. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a multi-sig API and SDK hands-on. Um, and then we'll look at a little bit of a peek into the BitGo service architecture, which is how we work. Um, cool, so let's get back quickly down to the basics first. Um, this is a transaction on the blockchain. Um, it's on blockchain.info actually, and you know, a transaction is basically a collection of ins and outs. So here's what it looks like, and um, these are the ins and outs, and this is what it looks like <laughs> it looks hard to read, but I will blow this up later. Here's what it looks like on uh, just using Bitcoin CLI to uh, decrypt the transaction and uh, decode it. And um, in this example, we have one input and two outputs. So that's the input and those are the outputs. Um, now just going up the input. Um, so the input references a previous transaction ID and the output index in a previous transaction. Uh, it doesn't actually refer to the address, although that's what it shows on blockchain.info. It actually refers to the previous transaction which I copied and pasted here. And so you can see that this refers to um, the out number one, which is this one in a zero denominated counter. Um, so like all inputs, it needs to contain the script sig, um, which uh, contains the signature to prove the ownership and um, there are two outputs in our transaction here. The simple one is just a pay to pub key hash here. Um, and if you can read this, it's, uh, well, what it says is um, the output script, uh, it says in the output script that the spender should present the uh, pub key of this hash, um, and, it, and the, the spender must sign the input with the correct uh, private key. And so let's look at this other output. Um, it is what is known as a pay to script hash, or P2SH. And when this feature was you know, actually added, many people said it was kind of you know, a bit like happy. And uh, this is, well, does anyone actually know why? <coughs> sure. Because uh, you have to decompress the, 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 the script from the output and <coughs> replace it. So it requires a change in the Right, so to some extent here, if you actually read this uh, script, what it says is just hash the, uh, hash um, the script tick, and then what it will give is the this hash, and then you just check that it's equal to the hash. So whatever the script tick is, you're just going to end up hashing it, and it's equal, then it should be valid, right? But uh, this pattern is actually special because as part of since page 16, um, the client is also meant to validate that that script actually executes, and um, the value that it returns after it executes should be true. And so this allows us to create uh, addresses that can have our own like contract requirements to spend or satisfy a script instead of just a single signature. Good question. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you know what the bit? No, I don't work on it. Sorry. Well, great. Okay, so we have two people who wrote this bit and are standing with us here today. That's great. So how to spend this P2SH output? Um, so this was the output from the previous page, and this is the input in the spending transaction here. Again, just in uh, the raw Bitcoin CLI. Um, if you look at this ASM, um, the last bit here is the redeem script that you need to provide in order to spend in P2SH. Um, so you provide this redeem script, and when you decode it, it's actually 
state, it actually just shows the script that you need to obey in order to be able to spend. Uh, here it says two, and then it's got pubkey, 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 three, and op check multisig. And so what that is asking for is that it's basically saying that this is a two of three multisig address, and you need to provide two signatures corresponding to any one of these three pub keys. And so in this spending transaction, you can see these two signatures over here that have been provided, and uh, that makes a valid uh, spending <coughs> transaction for this multi-sig address. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, no? Okay, good. So just going over it quickly, uh, pay to script hash is a Bitcoin address that requires successful execution of the script corresponding to the hash such that you can only claim it if the conditions were satisfied. So right now, I think around 8% of Bitcoins are held in P2SH addresses, and we think it's mostly multi-sig, but again, you can't really be sure, since um, the only time when you really know is when someone spends um, from a P2SH address, and not when the money is sent to it. How has that 8% grown over time? Um, slower than we like. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, so people when they put coins into some address and it's like for long-term holdings, they ask just a lot of friction to move it out, it's a way to move it out, and um, I think we need to give people more reasons to use P2SH, and the way we should do that is in, in a bit, I'll just show that uh, I think it's important to use uh, Bitcoin as, as operationally from a day, in a day-to-day -day basis. Actually, for that, you don't really need more than 8% of PTC like, just changing hands, moving around. Most of the time, you can keep your coins. Um, value storage is one of the uses of Bitcoin. So some of the nice ways you can use P2SH, um, you can use them in hash lock contracts. Uh, they were one of my favorite things to discover about Bitcoin when I first read the uh, Bitcoin wiki after reading the white paper. So um, anyway, here's the example. Uh, a and B want to trade Bitcoins for Doge funds. Um, so A thinks of any X and hashes it to HX. Um, so just to remind and state the obvious that X to HX is a one-way hash. So it's easy to go from X to HX, but given HX, you cannot get X. Um, and then on the Bitcoin chain, um, A first creates a transaction TX0 to a P2SH script, which will be able to pay Bitcoin to B if X of HX is known and signed by B or um, to pay to A if, well not really, but yeah, to pay if it was signed by A and B. And why you need this uh, refund clause over here is such that A can create a refund transaction TX1 with TX0 as input added at a future date, um, a few days later for B to sign. And then uh, B should sign a transaction going with the funds going back to A um, at a future date. Uh, in three days later. The reason why A needs this to happen first is uh, if B doesn't sign this and B runs away after TX0 is broadcasted, then A would be stuck with his funds in this uh, P2SH address. Um, there are some problems with this approach, uh, which we will like, roughly go over later. Um, which has, you know. Anyway, so on, on the Dogecoin chain at the same time, or just right after that, then B does pretty much similar and he sends to a P2HH script saying pay 2 million dollars to A if X of HX is known and signed by A. And then he can broadcast this um, transaction as well. And um, at this point, uh, both transactions have been locked up in, in, in the sense that they're both they're on both chains. Um, so the Bitcoin is locked up here and the Dogecoin is locked up here. And then all A has to do at that point is claim his Dogecoin by revealing his X and signing um, to claim from this input, and as soon as he does that, um, then X of HX will be known, and therefore B can claim his bitcoins right here, um, as long as he well, and hopefully he does it before within three days, because otherwise A will just get the coin back. Um, so uh, this, I think, I thought it was pretty cool the first time I saw it because it's the only way you can kind of do like atomic uh, trades or transactions. Um, and there hasn't been any way that. I've seen before that you could do it outside cryptocurrency. Um, like, you know, if I were trading Swiss francs and USD with someone else and I sent him the USD and he didn't send me the Swiss francs, then too bad, right? Like, I can't really get it back. I would have to either sue him or get some lawyers after him, something like that. So that 
that's uh, pretty much it. So the other main use of P2SH, uh, multi-sig addresses, uh, like we said, it spends um, a multi-sig address in Bitcoin is an address that is associated with more than one private key, and the script looks like as such, you know, M plus keys, and then N, uh, M being the number that you want to sign, and N being the total number of hub keys, and then just OP check multi-sig. And then to spend, just do uh, zero, which is well above, you just have to put one zero extra. Um, put a bunch of signatures, the, at the M number of signatures, and then this begin script as well you know, to spend it. It's commonly two of three, um, but uh, most multi-sig, I mean, yeah, most of them are two of three. You can do up to M of N. I think your M, like currently at most, you can do maybe 15. Um, because of the limitation of the size of each script. But uh, yeah, Peter is nodding his head. So thank you very much for the validation. Um, and uh, well, uh, we have a bunch of multi sig wallets right now uh, on the market that anyone can use. Uh, most of them combine multi sig addresses with, with 32 HD addresses, so you can generate more addresses. Um, from the root level uh, based on the derived HD part of each key, um, which gives increased privacy to uh, the people using the wallet. Uh, so the interesting thing to note about in, is that uh, in Bitcoin, um, we minimize the dependency on trusting humans or people in general, and instead we depend on you know scripts and contracts to secure funds. Um, but uh, when there's a gap, <coughs> It, in what's happening in the real world with what is modeled in code. For example, when you have a company with multiple directors that really should be controlling a joint bank account, um, but instead they use a single SIG address, um, which is really like a single account, where um, a low-level employee gets a hold of it, then losses can occur. Uh, because the you know, operating scenario wasn't properly um, described in terms of in, in, in the code. Um, so we want to actually properly design and study uh, the key and security model, and we're going to start looking at some multi-sig models from the easy ones to you know what some of the emerging ones we're seeing. Um, but please keep in mind that you know a real business will ultimately need to expand these concepts and uh, combine them. So for storage of multiple devices, uh, that was one of the first uses of Bitcoin. You create and use these keys on separate devices, such that you know the hacker must compromise multiple machines. Um, we make sure that no one device ever holds more than one private key. Um, that's pretty important. You don't obviously just create all the keys on one machine and then bring them to different places because if that machine was yeah, compromised, then you could lose your funds in the future. And another thing is you don't uh, bring your keys together and then sign them all on one machine. You bring your transaction to each machine, get the signature on each one of it, and uh, that's how you don't lose your funds. It also gives you redundancy if you use you know, M where N is less than N. Um, then you can put your keys in various physical locations and if any one of them is attacked, uh, you, you can get back the funds. Uh, another use for me just personally is I try to use very secure passphrases and sometimes I forget one of them. So with M of N, that's pretty nice for me. And this has happened before. Um, uh, so some of the examples where you can just do this simple storage of multiple devices, Bitcoin D supports it. Yeah, Bitcoin D isn't really a multi-sig wallet, but it does support like a multi-sig. And I think uh, Greg was the one that posted the initial code to use that to generate uh, multi-sig uh, transactions. Uh, some hardware wallets right now are also starting to support a multi-sig. Um, I think the important and nice thing about them is that there's going to be much less malware on a hardware wallet. And uh, the point of a hardware wallet is that it has the private key in it and just sign transactions and never allow the private key out. So the next thing is a multi-sig uh, joint wallet with multiple parties. So from just multiple devices, now we can have multiple people. Um, for example, you can have a two or four multi-sig used for family savings. Say, um, you know, four people in the family and they all save up for a birthday gift, two of them then go and co-sign with each other to buy something on Overstock. You can have a custodial child wallet where the, the child um, is in the wallet with the mother and the father, 
and the parents fund the wallet. When he wants to buy some books or something, he can go to either his mom or his dad and ask them to co-sign uh, on the wallet with him. And you can also have a business partnership. Uh, so if you have three people in the business, then you can say kind of like, if I have a two-person quorum, then I'd like to be able to spend my funds. Um, and I, I think BitPay's uh, CoPay wallet is a pretty, pretty awesome implementation of multi-sig, very easy to use uh, for this purpose. Um, some of the things you should note about you know, multi-sig in general is that when you do it this way with um, just the traditional method, uh, you can't really change the people on the wallet. So because remember that the address is really the hash of a bunch of puppies, um, if you wanted to change the number of people approving or the number of people on the wallet, then you need to make a new authentic address or authentic wallet. Um, the other thing is that all signers are equally important, so you have to be careful. So for example, if I wanted to secure some coin and I had two other people, say my friends, come into a two or three multi-sig wallet for me, um, and I would say, oh, well, I thought that um, then when I want to get my coins out, I'll just get one of them to co-sign with me. Well, that's kind of risky because if the two of them ever met up and colluded with each other, then I could be in trouble. Uh, another very interesting thing that people have been talking about using multi-sig for is really escrow. Um, this is done with two or three keys uh, with the buyer, seller, and escrow, and where the buyer, seller send funds into the shared wallet. Um, if the buyer receives the item in good order, then they just create a payment transaction with the seller, and otherwise an escrow agent can mediate. Um, and the interesting thing is that for the first time ever, the es escrow agent with just one key can never ever steal the funds. Um, this was, I think it's seen as a huge use case for multi-sig uh, originally. Um, and I'd like to see it used more. It's used by some of these open yeah, design. Bitrated is another one that's pretty awesome. Right, yeah. Um, Bitrated is, is, is what do you like Bitrated? I, I like the interface and the, the whole workflow that it's set up and the arbitration is mm -hmm. Bit rated, like arbitrated. Right, bit rated. R A T is bit rated. Uh, I think it's still in search of like a successful like P two P market, which is not illicit. Well, I mean, you could in theory use it for you know P two P market places, which for any purpose. Um, but I don't know why it hasn't been used on a large scale yet. Uh, I know that uh, what was the name of that P two P market place that. Uh, recently went down. Evolution. Yeah, um, they claim to have multi-sig support, but I believe it was like an option and not like the forced workflow. And so they could run away with this, they run away with some funds, which isn't, you know, is, isn't great. So you need people realize they want this stuff after the fact. When it's too late. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, they they realize it too late. So I think once someone actually implements it and just does it for for all users on that P2P platform, um, then you know other platforms which just don't use it uh, should start to see users moving over to multi -sig. Does Bitstamp use multi -sig default for all its transactions? Right, uh, we'll get to Bitstamp's model soon. <laughs> um, micropayment channels, uh, just worth going over this. Uh, customer creates a transaction going to a shared 2 of 2 address, uh, and we require that the Provider sends an end lock time refund for the full amount using the same trick, and the customer can publish TX0. Um, and I mean, okay, so let me back up. The whole purpose of this micropayment channel is really to reduce the number of actual transactions going out to the blockchain. And this has a few uses. First, it reduces the load on the network, which doesn't take a very high transactions per second. And the second thing is you pay less fees. So the idea here is the customer sends, say, uh, wants to make a phone call. So he sends one Bitcoin into this shared 2 of 2 address, which is shared between him and the provider. And um, after that, um, during the transaction, um, he can do this mainly off-chain. Um, during the first minute, he sends 0 0.99 back to himself and 0 0.01 to the provider. During the second minute, he sends 0 0.98. So he replaces the previous transaction, which hasn't been sent to the network. Um, but instead, he sends another, another 0 0.01 to the provider. And then they progressively um, start replace, just progressively replace these off-chain transactions without ever, them, ever sending them into the network. So um, just do it between themselves. The provider knows that uh, because the refund transaction is still in the future and can't be used by uh, the customer, then he's, he doesn't need to be in any rush to cash these in. 
Um, so he waits until at the very end, when the customer's call is finished, um, and say it was 45 minutes later, then the, he broadcasts just the last transaction to close the micropayment channel. So like many of the previous uh, you know, concepts that I showed, um, this use of the refund transaction is uh, subject to the you know, transaction vulnerability problem, which has been discussed uh, in, I think, a previous SF Bitcoin devs meetup with uh, Tajay. Yeah. Um, so for those of you that haven't seen that video, I highly recommend it. Um, he described some ways that you know, the issue can be mitigated. The basic problem is that uh, because the end of time refund, um, the, uh, oh, sorry, the end of time refund, let's call it TX1, depends upon TX0 as an input transaction. If you change the transaction ID of TX0, then the refund transaction becomes invalid. So the provider could, a bad provider could uh, manipulate TX0's ID, and then without the re refund transaction, um, just you know, blackmail the customer into all the funds hostage. Yes, all the funds hostage. Exactly. That's that's right. totally right. Um, transaction liabilities getting fixed for this application. This is a this requires checkbox not verified, and that's getting yeah. implemented probably in zero one. The code's not in yet. Talk to you, Tom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so do you think we'll get this year before the winter? Or yeah, yeah, I think that's very likely. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Uh, great. Uh, so, one more use instant confirmation. Some merchants, um, <coughs> well, most merchants, in my opinion, and I mean, there's many opinions about this, when you accept Bitcoin, if it's a small amount, uh, to me, if it's like you know, coffee, you shouldn't really worry about it getting double spent. So you can accept zero confirms, but some people don't want to do that. So one way around it uh, with downsides in that you require a trusted party is that you have a clearing house that creates a two of two uh, multi-sig address for the customer, which the customer then pre-funds. And then the concept is that once the customer's funding transaction is confirmed, then any subsequent payments out of the wallet uh, can be guaranteed instant confirms because the clearing house would never double spend uh, the same input. Um, so as long as the merchant trusts this clearing house, then um, he knows that it will never be double spent. Double spent. Um, and actually this, well, yeah. So I think BigPay Impulse uh, implements this along together with the uh, micropayment channels. And so you kind of get like a trusted payment channel, which is pretty cool. Um, is that live? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think they've, they've shown some demos. I, I, I can't be sure. It's we, we still call that payment channels. <laughs> payment channels are a totally separate idea for implementing sort of fast, small, renegotiable amounts. Yeah, we, it's and it's and BitPay did call their approach uh, that way. But uh -huh. it's sort of confusing. Many people thought, oh, they're using payment channels to implement it. Oh, so you mean they are not using payment channels? No, they're not. Oh, I thought they could do micro transactions off chain. But that's not payment channels. Oh, okay. <laughs> this was also so. So this is also implemented by the read address wallet, right? Which they unhelpfully call <coughs> read address, which was previously a name used to do something kind of related but different. Right. Um, so so maybe yeah. So payment channel is basically it's a micro payment channel, and yeah. that's not what the yeah does. right. Okay. Sure. Well, that's it. That's not what we address us, that's, that's yeah. sure, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of different. Anyway, um, the final model, or one that we'll introduce even more later, is um, the co-signing service. Uh, that's what Bitco is. Um, in this model, two keys are created and held by the customer, uh, with the co-signer holding just one key. And so for this scheme, the user is in full control of his funds, as you can see, um, at any time, uh, he can always withdraw his funds from the address since he holds both keys. And uh, the service with only one key can never send any transactions out themselves. And um, one of the customer's two keys typically um, in this model is usually designated as a backup key and put in the vault or the custodian. And when the user wants to spend funds, then they use the single key which is left, which is not in the vault, and um, they sign a, create and sign a transaction um, with the, that operational key, and they pass it on to the co-signing service. And then um, the co-signing service can then evaluate a bunch of rules and apply some security policy in an automated fashion. And um, so
some of these rules help security. I think others can even help to bridge some external contracts onto Bitcoin. Uh, the thing is, with, with doing it this way, um, you can now get uh, you know rules which are not subject to just Bitcoin script uh, because the cosigner can evaluate pretty much any logic. Um, so you can describe more scenarios in this model. And we're going to take a look at some of them now that uh, BitGo has been implementing or is, has implemented and is on the way. Before you go, um, which one of those cosigner evaluation rules have you seen to be in most demand from the BitGo clientele? Well, the easiest one is just the transaction limits one. Mm -hmm. So um, as I'll show later in, in the, well, I'll show it later anyway. Um, Bring on the hotness. You're on. Uh, enterprise Treasury. Uh, so the backup key again is held by the company CEO or lawyers. Uh, it's a two or three wallet. Um, so we have the users on a day to day basis just use share the single operational key. Multiple users sharing a single operational key. Um, so BitGo holds this uh, co signing key, which is the last key of the three. And um, in order to authorize any user or co sign or even allow any transaction to be uh, initiated to us. Uh, we require 2FA and user authentication onto our platform. And this allows us to do things like having employees able to spend very limited amounts, very small amounts, but uh, for larger amounts, having the CEO and CFO able to approve the large withdrawal. Um, and some people that use it are like Bitcoin Foundation changed it. Wait a minute. Is that the Yes, that is. So yeah, they use it for a treasury. Uh, it, it's good for controlling funds. Very easy when you have the money. <laughs> Just need to keep, make sure the money is kept safe. Uh, the the thing about this model is because the um, the uh, authentication of the employees and you know the, the various players at different levels on the wallet uh, evaluated by the co-signer. You can dynamically, with enough approvers, you know, change your rules. You can add cosigners and remove them. And um, it's more typical to match like, a company hierarchy kind of case, but it still stops the hackers that steal, you know, one or two, one private key, and it stops the inside jobs um, unless the CEO. Well, even you can make it such that even the CEO needs another side. So, do you have any case studies where an example of enterprise treasury? You know, failure on the client side required you know some sort of intervention or performance by Bitco. Um, actually, we do not. Um, so all customers have been really good at securing their. Well, one of the things that uh, customers do do is they they forget passphrases. So if they do forget, so what what happens typically is, and this is not great. I'll explain um, a better way to do it later. Right now, when you go to the site and you create a wallet. Um, you can choose how you want to get the backup key created. And if you choose backup key create, to create a backup key in the browser at that time, then what the browser does is it creates both the, the, the two user keys. Uh, remember that you, the creator owns two of the keys on the browser. And uh, at that point, it then prints out a backup you know, sheet with those two keys which are encrypted by a passphrase. Now, if you lose that passphrase, then you won't have access to your wallet. So that's the most common problem we see. Uh, we solve this in a way by when we print out this passphrase, uh, sorry, we don't print out passphrase. When we print out these encrypted keys, we also um, print out a special box D or QR code, which is the encrypted passphrase. And in this case, it's encrypted not with the user key, but with a key which BitGo owns. Um, and so we control that private key. The user only has the public key at that point, which they created the wallet. So we don't have all this is done client side um, in in terms of printing out the page and generation of the keys. So we don't have the user's passphrase. The user encrypted it and put it on their backup page. But what happens is if they do lose the passphrase, then um, if they come to us and prove that they are who the real person, then we can give them the private key, which. Uh, unlocks that encrypted passphrase. And then with the un encrypted passphrase, which is unlocked, they can then get access to the wallet. So that's uh, one of the common problems that we see. Where we have to intervene. Right. Uh, cool. Uh, next case, uh, ATM provider. Um, so ATM providers with single key wallets is kind of risky. If you put 
you know, a single key wallet on, on the ATM itself, the ATM might get stolen. Um, so what they do is they actually create a shared wallet um, where they have a single Bitcoin shared multi-sig wallet with multiple machines. And why multiple machines? The reason for, for this is that they actually want to have one wallet shared amongst all the machines so that they don't need very high capital requirements. So if they create individual wallets on each machine, then if each machine might take up to you know like hundred Bitcoin to draw in a day, then they have to keep hundred times n machines. But if they do it uh, in a shared wallet, maybe only need like two hundred um, in case people like, suddenly dip, withdraw or like, deposit the whole um, So they can create one access token per machine um, on the go and do an IP lockdown for each token. So if someone like takes the machine, the ATM machine, and have you seen like some of these Bitcoin ATMs are pretty light. <laughs> you just take them and Sky. Yeah. Right. bring it uh, home. Um, then because of the IP lockdown, it won't work. You can revoke the tokens individually. And um, you can also set up your bunch of usual policy rules, like your limits. So if it's over a certain limit per machine, um, then uh, it requires approval uh, of another you know, human. You can also do funky things like time of day limits. So if your ATM is in like a shopping center, which is not open 24 hours, then you know that it's not meant to transact on certain hours. Uh, some Lamasu ATMs have integrated this. Uh, now for the Exchange Hot Wallet. This is my uh, favorite integration, and it's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, help a lot of people, a lot, a lot of exchanges. Uh, because for me, I myself uh, was affected by the empty box thing last year. Um, I was trading some coins in there, and you know, we kind of knew that it was going down, but it was too late by then to get the coins up. Uh, but anyway, so uh, it's, it's one of the personal things that I, I want to fix, because I think that we need to fix the reputation of our exchanges, stop them from losing coins. Um, so the idea is the exchange in this model, which is the simplest one, uh, just maintains a single hot wallet for all deposits and withdrawals, which is controlled by a uh, multi-sig uh, address. This is a multi-sig wallet. And the outgoing withdrawal amount can be limited per day to minimize the losses if someone were to get a hold of that key and somehow manage to you know, pass through all the other policies. Uh, the great thing is that we can also get the cosign to make an automated request callback to the exchange uh, out of band to confirm that each transaction uh, coming is on the account database. And this really helps when the account database is actually on a separate machine or separate network from the machine which is sending the Bitcoin. Because then if the attacker gets to that machine and gets the private key or even tries to send transactions from that locks down IP address, um, then when we make this call back to the account database, it will simply not get it. Um, question for you. Mm -hmm. Given that Bitstamp at the time was the largest you know, Bitcoin exchange, mm -hmm. why didn't they use this type of functionality given that you, know, you guys already had it and I'm sure you spoke to them? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love for them to uh, answer that. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish you could paraphrase. <laughs> um, you could paraphrase, it's not. No, I mean, I people are starting to integrate it. it just, it's just that. Is Bitfinex integrating this? Uh, I can't say, I can't answer that. Oh, but um, sorry. they might be. Um, we hope they do. <laughs> we hope they do. Um, um, I just think, you know, right now Bitcoin is just about trying to get more users in. And as most of us are startups, um, then it's important for, I wouldn't say it's important, but rather the mantra of many startups to just go for growth. And many of them, as a result, they suffer in terms of things like security. But now uh, people are waking up to this idea, and uh, we have a lot of new exchanges running multi sig behind them, which is good. Cool question. Mm -hmm. Can I have another wallet, or a, a two or three wallet? Mm -hmm. um, it takes two people to, to, to sign the transaction. Yes. How do you check a balance? Do you need two keys in order to check a balance? Um, so it depends. Uh, if you use an HTTP key scheme, like what we do, then you kind of need, well, you need the, the all three keys to derive, derive the balances. Because you need to know, you know which addresses are the funds being sent to, and then you tally up all the addresses, and uh, you get your balance. So it's then, not because you don't have the private keys, so you don't have the public keys. Yeah. If you have the public keys, then you know what addresses and what scripts are involved. 
So you can do things like uh, watch only wallet or query particular databases. Okay, that makes Whenever you know what keys are involved, yeah. even that can be private. You have to have just the public keys. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and you also need to know the, the HTTP derivation path, like, you know, how the wallet Well, you need to know the public keys involved, however you come up with those. If they're right, right. right from an HD box, that's how you do it. Exactly. Um, well, okay, so back to this. It's currently the quickest integration path for many, many exchanges because most exchanges actually use Bitcoin D running in the background. Uh, of, of them and they, they just have a single pool wallet where the customer wants to withdraw, they take it from there and the customer wants to deposit and you just you know, call uh, create a new address and, and just generate uh, addresses to be deposited to. Uh, so the next model that uh, we're seeing come up is this exchange owned segregated wallet. It's not really customer owned yet so not 100% not but uh, it's still pretty, pretty good and interesting. Uh, the exchange creates a single wallet per exchange user and this gives us BitGo, the, abil the ability to implement a per-user wallet policy granularity on the wallet since we can see these individual wallets. And the other great thing is, you know, the user given the, the, a view only view of, or, or a view of this public keys can now see the balance in the customer wallet. So they can kind of get like you know proof of reserves that the, that the balance is always there. Um, uh, we can require it, we can set it up such that withdrawals from the, this Bitcoin uh, multi-sig wallet require user 2FA. And so the exchange user signs up his phone number on BitGo. And what this does is um, when uh, he wants to withdraw any funds, then the exchange will create and sign a transaction to BitGo. But BitGo requires the OTP of the user. And so uh, even if the exchange were to get you know, compromise, um, then we wouldn't sign up on a withdrawal uh, without the user's OTP. So it makes it a little bit harder. Kind of like you need to you know, compromise both institutions. And exchanges have been driving for this functionality? Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, for all clients or just specific clients? Uh, we like to do it for all clients. Uh, so we're trying to make it such that they, they can do it for everyone. Right. Um, the reason why they need to do it this way and own the keys is they need to be able to house uh, wipe this transaction to the house wallet. The reason for this is some of the exchanges, the more complex ones, uh, need need things like uh, they, they have margin requirements <coughs> and then margin trading. So if let's say you had like ten coins in your wallet and you use that to take a long position of maybe fifty coins, then if you are in lost position and you, and the exchanges don't actually control the wallet, then what happens is that uh, you might not sign off on a transaction which is you know, giving up your coins. And so then the exchange can't get a hold of those coins. So this is all done on chain. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. But so how do you do when there's like a uh, trading company? Uh, we cycle every certain number of minutes. Okay. So every like every block or every few blocks. Yeah. Right. We settle every single number of minutes. Otherwise, every single matchup will cause a transaction, and that's. So is it just one transaction when you're going to see it, or could it be more? Um, it's one. Tran it's multiple. Um, but we can make it work with just two actually in theory. But it might get very big and we can just put it up. Um, that's like implement like some implementation detail which is quite challenging we're still working on it. I mean this model is a lot more hard to implement uh, because they are real transactions from even like customer to customer. You can't cheat and just do off chain things like you know in in some of like you know, Coinbase or whatever like just holding the OTP. Um, so yeah I mean the downside is the customer doesn't own the key. So what happens if the customer owns the key? Um, that's another model that we like to look at. So every customer owns their own private key. Uh, we can have the backup key helped by an arm's length custodian. Um, and I'll show you why later. But uh, by orders from the exchange, if it's confirmed in fiat, or maybe even on you know, some other you know, USD backed uh, coin or something, could be sent directly to the user wallet. So the user can you know, use the wallet like even on a day-to-day -day basis, if they want to use this wallet um, to, to just trade the bitcoins in and out or even use the coins right away. Um, the user owns and holds um, their keys and they own this wallet. It's theirs after all. So the buy orders will send the coins right in. So the sell orders can be confirmed by the exchange instantly as long as the backup key is held by the arms custodian. Since we use that kind of instant confirmations model, 
where we know that big goal will not double sign and the um, arm's length backup custodian doesn't double sign, so the exchange, once receiving the coins from this wallet, um, can just go ahead and credit it to the user. And so this is kind of great for places that just, like you know allow you to just buy Bitcoin or sell Bitcoin, but it doesn't support you know the margin trading case or uh, you know cases where the the customer might not give up his coins when he should. Selling so, Bitcoin. <coughs> um, yeah, you just want to buy like maybe a Coinbase without the exchange. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Um, and then the final model for exchanges is the exchange plus user joint wallet, where the exchange and user each hold a private key. Um, so uh, again, you can get instant confirmations because you know that uh, BitGo and the exchange won't double spend. Um, but to prevent the user from running away with his coins after placing, say, a limit order, then we simply make a webhook call um, from the co-signer of BitGo back to the exchange to ensure that the user has sufficient margin. So when the user wants to make a withdrawal, then you just make this record call, and you know if he has outstanding trades that he hasn't closed, uh, then we just say, um, you know, please close your trades first before you to uh, to withdraw. And uh, this is still pretty nice because the user holds a key and it's recoverable if the exchange uh, goes up or you know suddenly yeah, just suddenly disappears. Uh, so here's a generic use case for cosigners in general um, that uh, we're seeing count as well. So let's say two, <coughs> just just generic HTTP callback. Let's say two users uh, want to make a bet uh, on the price of Bitcoin in June. Um, they just deposit two BTC, one BTC each um, into this like you know, hedging wallet, uh, shared authentic wallet, and then come June when a decision is made the winner can create and sign a transaction for two bitcoins going out of the wallet and when it reaches bitco we do some basic checks like we check that the you know the beneficiary of this transaction is either user a or user b and then we can make a um, web hook call out to any http endpoint which could execute you know any arbitrary logic to get external state and um, depend like just see whether this contract is valid or not and whether the winner is, is matching on the output of the transaction. And then only when that um, Oracle replies yes, uh, then we co-sign and transmit the transaction to the P2P network. That's pretty much it for the models. So uh, at BitGo, we built uh, you know, a suite of tools to make it easy for developers to create and operate these multi-state wallets. Um, and we open sourced uh, our client tools. Um, and all of them are built to operate in kind of like a trustless manner. In other words, BitGo should only have had one key, um, and all signing operations must be done client side, whether it's in the JavaScript SDK, in the Bitcoin D uh, RPC, or in the local REST service. So we're going to demo the JavaScript uh, SDK layer, and also a quick one of uh, the Bitcoin D uh, RPC interface. Um, we also have a local service, which is BitGo Express. The idea here is that when we first uh, release our APIs, we can't actually implement something like send coins just on pure HTTP API. Because remember that when you want to send a transaction, the client actually needs to use their private key to half sign the transaction before sending it to BitGo. And we can't be taking in their private key and you know we can't do something like implement send coins and then just pick the amount and you know the address and the private key. You don't want to take in the private key. So the idea is that we give you a local REST service to run um, and you run it in your own data center uh, make sure there's SSL between it and your other you know, front ends which are executing. And so you can actually send commands like send coins to this local REST service, and that REST service will uh, uh, perform the key operations like the key decryption and the signing within your data center and only send us a half sign transaction. Uh, some of our objects are uh, keychains, wallets, addresses, users, uh, policies. Um, and we also have blockchain data like transactions and blocks and uh, some web hooks. Our SDK, the JavaScript SDK that we're gonna, uh, that I'm going to demo is uh, based upon uh, Bitcoin JSLib, and uh, so you know we use most of, most of the transactions that sign there. We also use uh, SJCL to do key encryption and decryption. So I'll demonstrate the uh, JavaScript SDK and show you how to make a multi wallet. Uh, we're going to do this all uh, in real time. It's going to be 
Good for the next one hour. Um, so now to create a wallet, uh, I just do var wallet first to get the variable, and then um, to create the wallet, I do pickle.wallet dot create wallet with keychains. So you can do these in individually. You can create you know your keychains individually and then send them up in a different call. But this one actually does them all for you. So a passphrase and what this does is it encrypts the keys which are generated here on the client side on this machine and it sends them to BitGo. So we just have the encrypted key, we don't have control of it, uh, we won't be able to decrypt it. The idea is that when you go to a different machine, um, you can still use a wallet. Uh, so you can put a label to the wallet and uh, then I'm going to give it the backup XPub, uh, which is just good practice. I didn't, don't want it to create two keys on the same machine. So I pre-created um, another key elsewhere. Oh, I can't actually see. Yeah, give me a second. All right, okay, yeah. So that X part is like that. And then I'll just say function, and then wallet goes the result, and then and the wallet comes back, so the wallet has been created. Um, so it just created one private key on this machine, used the backup XPUB that I provided it with, and asked it go to create another key on, on the service side. So if you wanted to, um, say, create uh, an address, then you just do wallet.create address. Private key um, the private key in this case, because I provided the passphrase, uh, is stored on the service in an encrypted form. It's encrypted with the passphrase. Where was it generated? On this machine. Okay, okay so we have an address here. Um, <laughs> just to demonstrate it, I'm going to find the address with some monies. So I'll just use the QR code here and you know deposit some coin in. Let's deposit two bitcoins. All right. So transaction for two bitcoins has come in, and we are going to use um, the uh, wallet dot transactions call to view the incoming transactions over here. So you can see it has come in, and if you want to actually view it in detail, then you can see the actual amounts of, you know, it's put in Satoshi's over here. But if you do this, divided by 1v8, that's uh, the two coins. And now I'd like to uh, pay for the pizza and the, uh, the beer. Bring in, bring in the money, baby. So um, <laughs> I'm going to do all the send coins. And uh, Tariq has provided me an address, so you need to confirm this address, uh, which I'm going to paste in mm -hmm. based upon what you sent to me. Yep. Uh, you better make sure it's right. This <laughs> 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 person stands up in the middle between him and you. Uh huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just going to 1.99 because I need to pay the fee. Don't shortchange me, bro. We'll deal with the difference. <laughs> I think it's a bit more than what you asked for. Oh, I don't worry. 
it's going to have a sell off soon. <laughs> um, so we have the amount, um, the address, and then I'll provide it with the passphrase which I used just now to decrypt the key. And then let's hope this works. Okay, that address is right, right? Yeah, hold on a second. Yeah, we have the address. <laughs> Alright, just wait a bit. But anyway, um, when I press enter, what it should do is decrypt the key that it was created <coughs> on this machine um, with the passphrase. Um, sign, create and sign the transaction, send it up to BitGo and this and, and BitGo should co-sign it. Because we haven't actually added any wallet policy yet. But we'll look at what happens when we do it later. So did you sign it yet or? No, I haven't yet. Is this correct? Yeah, and yep, send away. Okay, so let's try it. Okay, that was a typo. Uh, it's wallet passphrase. We'll see real live demos. I think it's going to give an error. Okay, it needs an unlock. Um, the reason why it needs this is it's asking for the OTP. Um, you can actually bypass this when you do it uh, programmatically. But uh, for security purposes, we require that uh, it's locked down to an IP address, and I think I have a fixed IP now. So um, that's why I'm just doing it. Uh, we actually have promised support as well in the SDK, but uh, we, I'm just using callbacks right now. So we're going to try to send coins again. Um, and that's the transaction. I hope that uh, you received it. But if not, I have uh, the, the proof here. <laughs> so uh, it's up. Oh my god, I want 1.9 million coins. Great. <laughs> oh, it looks like the lights have come on. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, let's take a look at what happens if you use a, a wallet which um, has some policy on it. So I created a wallet with some limits and policy, and um, I think that's the ID. <coughs> and I'll just do wallet equals result. Should still have money, okay. Yes, there's still a bunch of cash in it. And then I just need to do wallet.send coins again. And so now, first we're gonna send you a little bit more. So, we're gonna send you like just a, just a bit more. So, the limit on this wallet is 0 0.1, I think. So, that kind of works because it's below the limit. But if I try to send any more than that, um, more than 0 0.1. Uh, if I try to send this, then I will say it exceeds the per limit per transaction limit. And uh, you can programmatically get an approval for that, um, but uh, I can also show you how it looks like in the UI um, when getting a human approval, which really doesn't take uh, too much time. Get the OTP. Um, yeah, so well, there was one point four. Yeah, it says it's re you know requesting for permission where you need to approve the transaction or reject it because it was above the limit. And um, I'm going to reject this one. I think, um, enough pizza <laughs> <laughs> um, But um, so that's. Basically, it for the SDK demo. Um, you can also do other things like you can get, you know, you can get unspent directly if you want. Uh, although, so what happens is that uh, I think you say limit and you say uh, 
It should try and help you calculate the best unspends to use. Um, in this case, it's two unspends. Uh, but yeah, we have a bunch of other calls which you can get by the API. Uh, and we are going to uh, close this right now since we won't be needing it anymore. And we can go back to this. Uh, okay, so as our next step, um, probably one of the final examples is an exchange integration. Um, so I found this PDO open source exchange online. Um, anyone can just go download this exchange if you want to run one. Um, and uh, I've enabled multi-sig on it uh, just by doing the steps that I'm going to show you. Uh, you can get the exchange at github.com slash PDO. It uh, runs on Ruby on Rails and uses Bitcoin D uh, and a pool of customer funds. So our integration path uh, was BitGoD. And um, so what BitGoD is, is uh, yeah, it's uh, basically a, a RPC kind of replacement for Bitcoin D. And uh, so it implements things like you know, create transaction or create address. Um, send coins and, and ver various things that most exchanges typically use to call Bitcoin D. So by doing a simple change of the Bitcoin D uh, RPC port to the BitGoD RPC port, uh, we were able to get a PO onto our RPC exchange. Um, I'm going to show it to you right now. So this fictitious exchange that I set up is called um, the uh, N1 Million Club. And uh, I didn't bother to change anything else um, because I just wanted to get it working quickly. But it looks like a usual exchange. You have to verify, but I verify myself. Um, and then when you go to fund to fund your wallet, uh, you can deposit coins. And as you can see here, it is right now giving out you know, one addresses, which is single sig. And so I'm going to uh, log on over here. And then I think it's user go share video. Um, and then let me resize again. And then the idea is that first we're going to see what it looks like. So Bitcoin CLI is running on this machine. Um, and if you get info, um, this is just a typical old daemon here. It should be updated, really. Um, I think if you do create address, what was it? Mm. New address? Yeah. Create new address? New address. Yes. What is it? Get new address. Get new address. <laughs> Much typos. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if you get new address, then it gives you an address which starts with one. And so the idea here is that, uh, let's do this in the screen. Uh, I'll just start big OD, um, like that. And so, so it actually connects. Uh, no, it's called Bitcoin Payments. <laughs> like Bitcoin D is, you know, Bitcoin. Yeah. You don't pronounce it like Bitcoin. <laughs> it's called Bitcoin D. So Bitcoin D. But if you said God, it would be okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> just to you chose your company name. <laughs> Bitcoin D uh, actually proxies back to um, you can attach it back to Bitcoin D, so you can you actually advise to run Bitcoin D in the background as well, and give Bitcoin D the Bitcoin D RPC port. So what that will do is it will make sure that whatever um, transactions that say you create a webhook or you create a you know, BitGo webhook wallets or BitGo transactions based upon what BitGo returns to you. Um, you don't just accept them. Um, BitGoD will go into Bitcoin D and make sure that the transaction actually exists. So, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to send you like a very big deposit that you would just credit to your, your DB without first checking the transaction. Um, so now, get out of this screen. Um, I'm just gonna.
so I need to run setup the GoD, which actually seeds it with the private key at this point. I'm not going to show you the private key. Um, but from now on, if you do, uh, where is that? So let's say you do Bitcoin CLI, and then if you point the RBC port to uh, 1832, and do get new address, uh, then you should be getting a multi address, which you do. And then the next step that we need to do here is to go into PDO and um, start editing the configs. So let's find where it's connecting to Bitcoin D. So it's connected here in the currencies.yml. Um, and then all I've got to do is change the port. And then I restart the daemon. And it usually takes a while, but when it does, um, Instead of one addresses, we should have three addresses coming up. <laughs> so just hang on a while for the daemon to start. And yeah, so now we get three addresses on the uh, exchange, and anyone can get a multi-sig exchange. Um, it's a little bit, there might be a couple steps other than that. <laughs> um, whatever it is. Um, so now that you've Hang on a second. Let me re initialize this. I close I close the uh, notes. Alright, so now that uh, you've seen some of what the platform does, uh, I wanted to give you a little peek into how it works on our end. Um, over here and uh, you know some of these decisions were made, I have to preface it of course, some of these decisions were made during the earlier times, and uh, so it might not be the best way to do it now if you wanted to go out and do it, um, but it's uh, you know, just what we have. So we, this is a Bitcoin PDP network. We run a, a few Bitcoin D instances here, and we connect them to Bitcoin J. And so we run our indexing service in, um, in Java. Um, it writes the transactions that it sees to the ledger DB. And it also takes outgoing transactions from the send queue to be broadcast to the network. Um, the le so from the ledger service, it's, it's connected to a bunch of task workers. And what these workers do is they categorize these tra incoming transactions into the actual uh, HD wallets, the HD monastic wallets that they created, and it puts them, sets them up as unspent as well, so that we can quickly uh, suggest unspent when you need, when you need to, to, to spend it. Um, it kicks off also like things like the transaction webhooks, like if someone from the API has requested that we could give them a callback when the transaction on the wallet is seen, then it kicks that off as well. So let's then go to the other side of things, um, the client SDK and the API. So this client SDK, you know, we've seen it already, it's open source, it's, it's written in JavaScript uh, on top of Bitcoin.js and SJCL, and uh, most of our our products, the web client, uh, which you saw is used to as an interface for most of our like typical customers and individual users that want to manage a multi-sig wallet, um, it, it runs on the same API. Um, the Chrome app, uh, which is signed, um, just to make sure that you know some, you know, just in case we get compromised and someone changes our web wallet JS that we serve up, a Chrome app is a very s much safer way. Well, in some ways to make sure that we don't just change our JavaScript. Um, and then BitGo Express and BitGo D, which we demoed, um, they all run on top of the client SDK as well. So um, that kind of makes it easy for us to, to just build all these out. Uh, the fact that they utilize the same base SDK gives us more testing. We have some pretty extensive testing built up on the client SDK. Um, and we get good code reuse uh, as well uh, this way. Um, and I mean, thanks to BitGo Express, we uh, can actually support APIs in any multiple of language. Um, anyway, um, so the client SDK and the web clients, uh, they all get the same APIs, which are machines in EC2, these are ELBs in Amazon. Um, and the ELBs then hit the front ends. So these front ends, they perform um, things like the basic authentication logic. They respond to the APIs. Um, you know, with transaction and wallet data from the BitGo database. 
and they deal with external services, for example, OT and etc. And it's written also in JavaScript, Node.js, using the same similar libraries, Bitcoin.js, which you know again gives us this commonality, and we don't have to write things twice. We just test it once. So once a pending transaction is in the DB, um, then the co-signer or the key servers uh, are also written in Node.js. It's a separate service altogether. It's disconnected from the rest of the network. Um, and it, it picks up uh, the transactions and evaluates them for signing. So the key service uh, has all the private keys encrypted in, in memory with a master key. And this master key, um, it only lives ever in memory. So it needs to be unlocked. It, this is the master key. If you restart the machine, it um, needs to be placed there again by unlocking um, via multiple employees uh, within the company um, using uh, Shimmer's secret sharing. Um, which we believe has, is, is quite secure for us. Uh, and that, that fact that the key service is inaccessible from the outside. Uh, I actually didn't draw all the DBs on this diagram um, because we just don't want to make it that simple for to go after us. Uh, but anyway, after the transaction has been signed, we place it into a send queue and then uh, the, when, when the transaction is signed and put in the send queue, then the indexer service starts to pick them up. And uh, it's responsible for uh, making sure that the transactions actually hit the blockchain. Uh, actually, in practice, we kind of notice that sometimes this means that we need to send, keep sending the transaction out again and again um, if it doesn't get confirmed. Um, we try not to do it too often and not spam the network, but uh, it just happens to be what we needed to do. I don't know if anyone else has some similar experiences. Uh, not seeing any. Open an issue with uh, Bitcoin.org GitHub. Let's talk about it, right? Sure. Okay. Uh, Do you guys engage with uh, Bitcoin Core devs as part of you know your ongoing development? And well, yeah. I mean, we know them, and sometimes we had bugs. I think recently um, there was a bug in one of our machines that we didn't engage them with, uh, which I think managed to get diagnosed properly. I'm not sure if it's 100% uh, mm -hmm. solved yet. But uh, you know, we love being a part of you know, the, the community in that. Uh, so anyway, uh, coming towards the end, my final slide. Um, I think uh, we'd like to work on some of these things. <laughs> so third party key custodian services. So ideally, like I said, with multi-sig, you have to create the keys, individual keys on strictly separate machines, otherwise it might defeat the purpose if you get um, any one of, if your machine was compromised when you were creating the keys, and even better to have someone else hold them. The reason why um, is that as we've seen, uh, users have a problem remembering their passphrases and remembering their keys. So if what we'd like to do is give them a way to uh, store or rather get a public key from a third party, which is probably like an arm's length from BitGo. Um, and uh, the, the way that that has to work is we'd like to, to see some, some protocol and we're happy to you know, come up with that as well, um, such that uh, the third party can just give us the next part, but yet know who the customer is. And when the customer, and then we construct our, our wallet with that, that next part, with the backup key, like as we've seen. And then, uh, you know, if the customer loses their keys, and they can go to the third party service to retrieve it. And that might be at a price. I think there's a business model in that. Um, they can charge a price either to create the, the XPUB or even to retrieve it all both. Um, that's something that we think is pretty nice. Uh, we try not to hold more than one key, obviously, on our end. Um, because from a legal standpoint, that brings trouble because you end up in custody of the funds as well. Uh, Compatibility with other wallet services like multiple wallets. Uh, we've been trying to get support with other wallet services and clients um, such that the, the, the different clients can actually execute uh, or create transactions and send them to the co-signer for signing. Uh, this is a bit tricky because not everyone follows the same scheme for an HD key pop generation. And um, right now, the way we have it uh, is that you know a lot of our rules depend on how much have you sent out from this wallet. So if we don't know all the wallet addresses, uh, then we can't tally up the balance properly. Um, 
I, I mean, VIP45 does kind of solve this to some extent, but not everyone implements that as well. And um, so I, I think it's something that we want to work on. Um, uh, some other people have called, I think Mike Kern has called this the merit wallet like name. And uh, we think it enables a few other scenarios that could be interesting, so we're working on it. Um, some privacy improvements, um, as I discussed just now, uh, we know all the addresses on the wallet, so we know your balance. Um, but in theory, it's possible to stop this from happening, and you know, we, as BitGo, we might not have to track all your balances at all. Um, the client could track the addresses that they use, and then they can use, you know, maybe like SPVI, like Bloom filter queries to us. Um, to get the balances, um, and um, what we could do is we could say, all right, so we will be able to execute policy based upon what we have signed so far. So we would know um, when you come to us to sign a transaction, we would know that that money is yours, but prior to that, we wouldn't know your, your total wallet balance. So that's an improvement that we could make as well. Be aware that using the privacy improvement of new filters is, is very much just in practice, uh -huh. in theory it works, but there are various ways. In, in practice, there's no improvement in privacy. Oh, wow. Okay. I can direct you to some papers on this. Thanks. All right. Okay. Uh, multiple Oracle contracts, I think, are uh, uh, pretty cool to me. Um, has anyone heard of, like, uh, Horisi? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Horisi is, um, it, I think it provides a protocol to specify contracts that can be delegated by multiple oracles. So you specify a contract once and you send it off to multiple oracles. And um, when there are multiple oracles in like, you know, some M of M, like 8 of 11 configuration, then you, you require a lot less trust uh, for, for a single oracle. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I, I personally like contracts a lot. So I don't think that we need to wait for, you know, a Bitcoin 2.0. I think we can get it now. And this is one of the ways. So um, thank you for your time. Uh, I'd like to end up by, you know, uh, answering any questions and maybe what asking you what else you'd like to see in terms of multi safe development. All right. All right. We have a time limit. We have to be out of here at nine. So um, mm -hmm. we're going to take maybe three questions that I, you know, do a pre presentation. I people want to uh, sort of socialize before we exit. So. Any questions for Ben? I got three questions, three questions for Ben, but I want to say one more thing. Okay, I got one here, John. Is there a mobile wallet that's compatible with Big Go? Well, right now there isn't. Um, we wish there were, because I, I had to use a single SIG wallet for the demo. Okay. So when you were earlier demonstrating your the Node API, uh, I saw that the wallet object contained three expo, mm -hmm. uh, and I think there were different routes. There were, I think it was the same, uh, as in uh, all just slash zero slash zero. They were all slash zero slash zero. Yeah, for each one of them. Uh, routes. Okay, so what are the routes? Or what yeah. are the three keys? There are three keys, um, yeah. and each one of them are slash zero slash zero derived from the original three ex experiment examples. Derived from? Um, so you give us these ex and ex pubs, right? You give, we have three ex pubs, right? And from these three ex pubs? What are the three ex pubs? Oh, you want screen. to see the ex pubs? They are, they are just... Yeah, no, well, I may be understanding. Okay. What are, why are there three keys? Why are there three keys? Yes. Oh, we need the three public who, keys. Whose keys are those? Yes. Who are, who are, who? Oh, those are the keys that were used to generate the wallet. So the local key, the backup key that you provided when you created the wallet, and the one that the service created. Yes. Okay. Those are the three keys. Okay. So that was, that was my question. What, what, what sort of wallet? What you say more about it?